Good morning. Cheryl Batts is an ordained minister called to Lakeview Assembly Church. She is the mother of Brett and grandmother to Brittany, Kalia, and Kamaris. Batts was a member of the Pleasant Street Historic District, was secretary for the statewide board of the Historic Preservation Alliance of Arkansas, a member of the Arkansas Museum Association, Afro-American Genealogical Society, Arkansas Chapter, Garland County Historical Society, Regard, Recognizing Everyone's Gifts and Respecting Diversity, Graduate of Leadership Hot Springs 2004 to 2005, President of the SPA Area Business and Professional Women, Leadership or Certified Volunteer Manager, and a member of the Arkansas Volunteer Coordinators Association. Recently, Ms. Batts received the honor as director of a film entitled Shine on Me, a documentary of turbulence and jubilation. The story of Petrella, Hot Springs' own African-American country western singer who has 25 years in the industry and still standing. In 2000, Remember When, a series of oral histories on film was introduced. Both were shown at the Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival. Ms. Batts was responsible for the research for the designation of two houses for the National Register of Historic Places in the Jonestown neighborhood of Hot Springs, the Webb Community Center of Hot Springs on the State Register of Historic Places, and furnishing information that secured the designation of Arkansas's largest African American historic district, the Pleasant Street Historic District. Based on the information researched and documented, in 2013, she added to her resume the title of author. Along with the help of two humanities scholars, she wrote the award-winning book, John L. Webb, The Man and His Legacy. That same year, Ms. Batts, as CEO and founder of Phoebe, she was responsible for the designation of the historic John L. Webb House as one of Arkansas's most endangered places. The past five years, her time has been spent successfully completing phased work areas in the restoration of the historic John Lee Webb House a contributing structure within the Pleasant Street Historic District. And it is my honor to share uh, Quindeci is her co-presenter. Quindeci is an architect artist residing under the created umbrella of Produsky Arameos Architectur an Arkansas-based design firm offering preservation architecture services. In addition, Quindeci uh, has spent serious time with abstract art, furniture design, as well as photography. For more than 20 years, Quindeci has also produced, uh, co-produced historic maps of Little Rock. And as well as Haven of Rest Cemetery, and he is currently involved in the restoration and rehabilitation of the John Lee Webb House, an anchor property within Hot Springs Pleasant Street Historic District. In addition, he's involved with the Scipio Africanus Jones House, the Manaphy Gymnasium, as well as he's done concept design for the Delta Rhythm and Bayou Cultural District in the Pine Bluff, Arkansas area. For more than 40 years of practicing architecture, Quindeci endeavors to focus on rural Arkansas as an underserved community while creating unique art forms as recent as his recently uh, exhibited as recently exhibited at the Faye Jones School of Architecture in Fayetteville. Quindeci, he's a graduate 
of Howard University School of Architecture and Planning, and he is a fellow within the American Institute of Architecture's College Fellows in 2017. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I understand that he does some okra crops, <laughs> which I am very pleased to accept those when the season starts. Please join me in welcoming our two co-presenters, Bats and Quindetchi. My name is Cheryl Batch, and I'm always known for doing something different. Yes. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? Now, I think anybody that takes on any part of the African-American history and culture has have to heard that song in their hearts. That's the only way you get a passion that sticks for 25 years, to go into a pathway in a place where you will find much of what we listened to earlier, all of the details of how our people were moved from one place to another, and unfortunately, it does not change. It's only the geographical location that changes, but not the way that is done. So as I bring to you my friend, Kondichi and I, information on mapping the Pleasant Street Historic District. You'll also see and hear within that the same stories that you just listened to on West Rock. You'll also be able to see that the movement of our people from one place to another, again, changes by where the jobs are and how they can work. We just finished a conversation about how the workers would go from uh, Hot Springs to Idlewild to work, depending on the season. Some would go to, to California and back again. So mapping Pleasant Street uh, Historic District um, has a much deeper meaning than what we thought it was going to have when we started out um, with the idea of doing this. When we put together the mapping of it, and I began to think back when I started 25 years ago with this project, the stories behind the houses that you will see kind of brought a bit of a tear, but I made up my mind a long time ago that as a preservationist, that if nothing else stands, I'll put a plaque there and they will not take it away. I'm going to put a plaque there and say, it used to be, it was here. We will not go down without a fight. Thank you. Good morning. This presentation is going to talk about the the conditions of the Pleasant Street Historic District in, in Hot Springs. And it's also going to give an overview of two particular people who have, have had, had an influence on the development of that uh, district. Uh, of course, John Lee Webb, and also Walter T. Bailey, the first African-American graduate of University of Illinois in, uh, in 1924. Both of them had the influence, had the frame of mind to uh, create this um, this really significant place, and I'm looking for the the next slide. And basically, um, the the idea about, behind a map came across because currently there's not any descriptive um, illustration of this district in the in Hot Springs. Hot Springs is probably the, the best tourist destination in the state, most popular tourist destination in the state. Does not have a handout, nothing to show people who might want to know about this district. 
So Phoebe has come up with this idea that's funded through the Curtis Sites Memorial <laughs> Grant to create this, this map. And the map basically will uh, be in collaboration with uh, the city of, of, of Hot Springs, of course with Phoebe, as well as the planning department and the Garland County Library and the uh, Arkansas Archives, the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. And uh, we hope to have it completed fall of 2023. This is a map of the district. Uh, just as a landmark, the, the uh, Bath House Row is to the top left. The Hot Springs Convention Center is, as you see it here. Um, the former Pythian Bathhouse, and, and we'll talk about that also, is uh, it's demolished, but it's, uh, it's a parking lot now. Uh, the existing Woodman of Union building is uh, existing. And of course, the Johnny Webb House. For reference, Grand Avenue is here. If you're coming from Little Rock on five, um, I forget the name of that number highway, but this is coming into Hot Springs from Little Rock, and you get down to Malvin Avenue. We talk about entrepreneur, uh, black entrepreneurship. Um, Malvin Avenue was equal, if not uh, more intense, as 9th Street is today, 9th Street right outside the window here. So we had a very popular, very dense um, uh, business district in Hot Springs called Malvin Avenue. So this is the, the, the area. It's the largest uh, African-American historic district uh, and uh, National Register historic district in the state of Arkansas. It has gone through uh, different sort of stages of, of, of concentration uh, due to uh, its status, as you might find in most historic districts here, even here in Little Rock, the Central High School National Historic District is, is, is uh, having issues because that 51% threshold, you have to have 51% 51, 51 of your properties must be contributing to the National Register, but because of demolition and, 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 and basically because of demolition, uh, that, that, that status is, is threatened. City of Hot Springs have had a couple of studies that are uh, that have been uh, have been enacted to determine what that what might occur to save or enhance uh, the historic district. They're talking about moving the boundaries, uh, but we, as a project, think that this map will reinforce the interest in this district, such that people might want to uh, invest. Uh, in, in the development of, of, the, of this um, particular um, historic district. Um, Hot Springs, as you all know, has baths, bath houses. Um, and the National Park Service have a very informative, very detailed uh, brochure that outlines the, the different ones. And I'm not going to go through the whole brochure, uh, but it outlines the different bathhouses that were either built by, owned by, influenced by African Americans. And the one we mentioned that we'll talk about is the Pythian bathhouse. Walter T. Bailey, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, a study that I did in, 19, in 2016, funded by the Arkansas Manatees Council, about Walter T. Bailey. Now, Walter T. Bailey, even though he was based on Bill Street in Memphis, he did four projects in Arkansas. Uh, he did several projects in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Mitchell talked about the World's Fair. Uh, Walter T. Bailey did a, a huge study about potential projects that could be built uh, on the grounds of the World's Fair. But in Arkansas, he did the, right next to us, the State Temple Building, Mosaic Temples of America. That's his design. He also did the Gym Theater, just up the street, a block or two. I have all of his documentation, the drawings that he had prepared for the gym theater. And then you have the Pythian bathhouse, which is demolished. One significant thing about the Pythian theater is the fact that the, the, the Library of Congress has a program called Historic Architectural Building Survey. And this building is the only one that in the state of Arkansas done by an African-American architect, which got part of that survey. And I have all of the documents uh, the technical documents re related to that. 
And then you also have the Women of Union Building also standing. This is existing. So of these four projects, the State Temple Building right next to us and the Women of Union building, building are existing, standing, functional. This is a photograph of the Pythian bathhouse, which has been demolished. For reference purposes, you see the Woodman of Union building. This is existing, just a, a half a block or half a block to the south of the Pythian bathhouse. Building right there. Also, this small building is, is interesting. Dr. Edith Irby Jones, eminent African-American doctor, had her office at this location. When she first got out when she first got out of UAMS. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the building was recently demolished within a month ago. Yeah, yeah, a car recently, ran into it. A car ran into it, recently demolished. I have photos before it was demolished. Uh, Cheryl said, you must come down and look at the, the, the building. The roof is collapsing in the back, some minor damage. So I took photogra photographs of the building, and it's just sort of an ongoing process. Maybe someday we can get the owners to maybe do something with that building, but uh, I was informed less than a month ago that a car ran into it and it's totally demolished. Um, the Pythian bathhouse had a cornerstone laying in January 31st, 1923. And this is just a, a copy of what I gathered from my research. There was a postcard also uh, that was sent out as a souvenir about that Pythian bathhouse. And that's all part of the research that was uh, gathered. This is the, not so much current, it's my, maybe two year old photograph of the Woodman of Union building. It's now a, um, a senior citizen a home, home a home for home us, harbor. For, home harbor mm -hmm. for seniors. For seniors. Mm -hmm. But it's well kept, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, it's, it's really a, really a, a great uh, tribute to Walter T. Bailey, the architect. Now, one thing that I don't want to get so involved in time-wise, but the collaboration with Walter T. Bailey and John Lee Webb was such that the brick that was used in the construction of this 1923 Woodman Union building likely was used for the construction or the recladding of the, of the John Lee Webb house, and I'll get to that. So that, there was some collaboration between the two. This is, uh, some of you may remember, this was also the National Baptist Hotel. If your, fam if your family were teachers back in the 50s, 60s, there were separate Arkansas teacher conventions. Yeah. The black teachers went to this building for their convention. Um, the white teachers went to Robinson Auditorium, I believe, uh -huh. at that time. Also, the National Baptist held their winter conferences there um, for many years before they moved it. Uh, the beauticians would have their conferences at the um, Woodman of Union, as it was called. And when it was built, it had a 2,500 seat uh, auditorium, which was the largest auditorium in the state not just for black folk, but it was the largest auditorium in the state on that uh, second, I think it's on the second or the third floor. And they still have not, even though people are living in the building, uh, they still have not revamped or uh, rebuilt that particular auditorium. So we're hoping that that will happen sometime in the near future. Another anchor to the Pleasant Street Historic district is the Visitors Chapel AME Church. It's on the north, uh, say the north end of the district, whereas the Johnny Webb House is on the south end of the district. This is an active church. We have talked about, well, how to find out who were the, who were the architects, who were the contractors. It's still an ongoing process, but it's an excellent church. I have interior shots, but time would not, you know, we, we don't have a sign, but it's really a, really a gem. Uh, of, a, of a property uh, within that district. John Lee Webb, uh, Cheryl Batch was an author along with Janice Kearney and Dr. Patricia McGraw of this, this very popular publication about his legacy. Okay. Uh, the book uh, goes from, uh, there was a book written earlier by Sutton T. Uh, Sutton T. 
Mr. Sutton T. Griffin, I think it was, and he had written that book sort of as an autobiography of Mr. Webb's life in the early 20s, and uh, nobody knew about it. It was kind of, actually, we found it in one of our seniors' homes. We went in to talk to a senior and talk about our uh, history, talk about what he remembered, about what was going on in Hot Springs, where he grew up. And this little book was laying on his table, and I happened to walk over, and I'm looking at it, and I said, is this a book about Mr. Webb? And he said, oh yes, he said, we had, we had a lot of those at one time. Now mind you, I had not even seen it, and this was like 15 years ago. And I kept looking at the book, and um, I said, well, can I take it home and read it? And he said, oh, you can have it, baby. You can just, you can just take it on home with you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't two months later that the gentleman passed away. So you, you know what I'm saying? So when our seniors tell us something or want to give us something, take it right then, because that next day is not promised. From that book, we were able to write this book, which went on to uh, get an award. We reproduced the smaller one, and then we put this one, uh, the smaller one, into that, where we took his life from, from the time he was born until he died in 1947. And um, it's full of a lot of tidbits. We found out the National Association of Policy Kings. Have you heard of them? Something you should look up. The National Association of Policy Kings, they were the, the black counterpart of the mafia, but they didn't do mafia. They built up Chicago, they built uh, up hospitals and churches, and that was where their money went to. So it was the same kind of internal thing. And uh, the only reason that they, um, they uh, got wiped out was because the federal government found out how much money they were making uh, running policy, you know, in out the back door at grandma's house, that little brown bag and everything. So when they, when they finally took them down, it was because of taxes. But guess what? It took its place. Anybody got to get gas? What? State lottery took the place of the state lottery, took the place of policy, the policy that our grandparents and parents before them were playing in the money state internally, uh, one of those entrepreneurial endeavors. <laughs> the anchor to, the southern anchor to the Pleasant Street Historic District at the beginning was called the Huggaboom House, built in 19 hundred by the Huggaboom family. They were business folk in Hot Springs who sold the house to Johnny Webb. Mr. Webb decided, and I think with collaboration with Walter T. Bailey, to do a major renovation of the house in 1925. This is the house, the, the wood frame Huggaboom house, a Queen Anne style um, house wrapped around porch in 1900, Mr. Webb decided, I'm gonna brick up the house. I'm gonna brick it up. I'm gonna change that roof from the shingles to clay towel. I'm gonna put a porta a drive up to get to my garage in the back. And I'm just gonna keep the form. The form is the same. You still have that turret, which is a characteristic of the Queen Anne style. But I'm gonna add this drive up covered driveway, porta as a the terminology. And I'm going to cover the whole thing in brick. In my opinion, my research says that that brick came from the same time as the Woodman of Union building was built. I have matching brick. There are other features to that. So this is 1925. Johnny Webb comes from Tuskegee with his family. Well, and actually, he came center. from Mississippi. Mississippi. He came from Mississippi. Uh, actually, he did graduate um, Tuskegee Institute. That's where he met a lot of the people that uh, helped him get into contracting. And he went on to marry a young girl from Helena, Arkansas. And he raised, uh, he had his family in Yazoo, Mississippi. So, yeah, so he went from Tuskegee, Alabama, Arkansas, Yazoo, Mississippi. He built practically all of Phil Phillips. Mississippi, which is hardly on the map at this point, and we've been trying to find out what happened to it. Was it engulfed it into 
something else. But the man was definitely ahead of his time and definitely sought after to do a lot of uh, construction work. And I believe that uh, meeting Booker T. Washington and all of these other named people we found out that he met, it was because those initial contacts of being a graduate of Tuskegee Institute, which we know was the place to be at that time. This is how the house is today, maybe four months ago, five months ago. We are still in the process. A lot of my input has been based on information from Phoebe, Cheryl, Witty Davis, um, and recreating what the house, how the house might have looked in 1925. We had no other documentation, but just from site surveying, taking samples, doing research, uh, we've come up with this product. Uh, some of the, most of the funds to, to get to this point were through the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. They have a Historic Preservation Restoration Grant Program. Uh, it's a matching grant. Phoebe was, I was very impressed with my client, Phoebe, to find ways to raise the matching amount. This grant pays two-thirds of the cost of what you want to do. One third is matching. Phoebe had to come up with that. I'm not going to tell you how they did it unless you want to, but uh, they, I, they, they, I think they, everybody they should. I think everybody should know because I know people are struggling to find matching funds, and we didn't know, but someone told us. Uh, Patricia Blick told us, and I was just like, you know, struggling. The matching grant for HPRG can come from CDBG. Now, CDBG is also a matching grant. So what you have to do is do what our folks did in the past, and that's big. Right. <laughs> Please, we, it, you know, I mean, and I don't mind sharing that because we've been on this a very long time. We realize the end is going to come pretty soon, either politically or we're going to be able to finish it. So we decided that we were going to get it to a place that if we didn't do another thing, it was going to stand for John Lee Webb and stand for Quindici and Phoebe and Cheryl Batts. Because, like I said earlier, there's a stand that you have to take in preservation. You may have to die on it, but at least you got something standing to say that we took it as far as we could. If you can, take it further. We only given a certain amount of time to do things. So, you know, if you can do, if you can do what, with what I just told you, what you're trying to do, then please do that do that. I, I, I have no qualms now about hiding information because it doesn't help. You know, you need to do what you need to do. I need to do what I need to do. Let the cards fall where they may and we just push ahead. The work that was involved was, was uh, involved the, the reconstruction of the roof. Mm -hmm. We took the same uh, ceramic tile that Johnny Webb installed in 1925. We had a specialist roofer to come and take all of the roof tiles off, to reseal, reconstruct the subroofing, and put those roofing tiles back. There was some missing, so we had to find a source out of Illinois uh, to supplement bricks that had been broken over time. All of the windows are restored. These are not new windows. These were the original 1925 windows that Mr. Webb put in and likely maybe the Huggaboom house, some of those windows remain. The portico was reconstructed. It was in very bad condition. We had to reconstruct that. Uh, the brick, the current, uh, we recently completed a grant to, to reconstruct brick. And I, I have a bunch of photos, but the, the back side of the house, the brick had fallen, the mortar had deteriorated, so you could just take your finger and clean out the mortar with your fingers. So we had to take all of the brick down on the back side of the house and had to have it reconstructed with new mortar. The current work this month, next month, is the tuck point. Tuck point meaning to clean out all of the joints around the house, put in new mortar, and that completes the building as an exterior. We still have site work. You may have seen on another slide the stone wall the wrought iron fence, that's original 1900 work. We're going to, that's a subject of another grant. And we're also going to now, uh, we're also now applying for the interior, work in the interior. Uh, the work, the house has been surveyed for asbestos, laid in mold, and there's some abatement that has to occur. 
But we want to start now with the reconstruction of the interior. The house will become a cultural center, and you can explain it a little bit further. <laughs> okay, it, uh, it will be a cultural center. We started off um, 25 years ago working with young people between the ages of 10 and 17, and it was their leadership skills that got the seniors to sit down and talk to them and tell them the stories. So we have over 150, 200 oral histories on film telling the stories of Hot Springs, Arkansas from the standpoint of these seniors. And they're on video, they're on film. So uh, once all of that information was taken in, um, we decided, okay, now what do we do and how do we work with these young people? So now we have a group called the Uzuri Project Youth Institute, and this is where we take the children from 10 to 17, teach them leadership skills, pull their pants up, look in the eye, shake the hand, all of that and more, so that they can, uh, by, this time, by the time we do this, this time, you guys would be the seniors, right? So they'll be able to get the stories from you because you will appreciate their ability to talk to you and look you in the eye. They will be in this building. This is their headquarters. This is where we'll move on into heritage tourism and teach them how to tell the stories of the house and the other houses that are in the Pleasant Street Historic District. We anticipate fall of 2024, subject to funds that we are seeking today uh, to complete the, the house. So just, we'll keep you posted. The next slide is a film that Cheryl's gonna narrate. Okay. What you're about to see now is something that we created to talk about Pleasant Street. So it's a film. That the sons and daughters of slaves and sharecroppers living in a small, segregated part of Hot Springs would become part of a national movement to save their homes in honor of their sacrifice, love of family, education, and entrepreneurial endeavors. The historic district covers 28 acres and represents the most intact area of the city's historic African-American community. In fact, it is the largest historic district in Arkansas, comprised of buildings constructed by and for African Americans. Sally Patillo Puckett, City, doesn't live on Pleasant Street, but she speaks volume. Her grandfather, on a trip from Malvern, Arkansas, as an itinerant minister with the Reverend Whitlock, would be the founder of Visitors Chapel AME Church. My voice is being heard now. I stood on the corner of Pleasant and Church, 310 to be exact. My name, Hollywood Barber College. I stood there from 1949. K.C. Kemp attended there. He lived on Ozark. Clement Johnson had a one chair at 416 Pleasant Street. Oh, we had numerous barbers. We would have time in the market, you know. We had shops on Malvern, Grand, and Market. But one family stands out, W.E. Barn, father of H.T. Barn. They stood 70 years on Pleasant Street and left a legacy with the daughter of H.T. Patrol, 25 years as the only country western soul singer. Papa do the rain dance, spend his time dancing like a man in a reaper's ass. Kicking up a storm and calling out to God to help him fix this mess. Now when Avenue was in bloom when I came here, there were many places that was owned and operated by blacks. There was the Alice E. Hospital that was operated by Dr. E. There was the Piffian Hotel that was owned by the uh, Piffian organization. And uh, on each side of Malvern Avenue was located by black. And uh, everything was carried out beautifully. They had nightclub, pawn shop. In fact, they had everything the blacks needed. Immigration help and did it, and it did a lots of harm. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing, we had uh, 
We had many doctors here when I came, many black doctors. There, I think I can name some of them for you. There was Dr. Walker, he was on, he had an office on Malvin. There was Dr. Boise, he had an office. Dr. Torrance had an office up the street here on Pleasant. Back this way. And um, Dr. Kim was a doctor, one of our main black doctors. And uh, let's see, we had many more. The Harris Funeral Home had served our community well over 50 years. The Emma Elise Webb Community Center, named in honor of Mr. and Mrs. John Lee Webb's daughter, Emma Elise, in 1945 at her early demise from ovarian cancer. And there it stands, the talk of the town, Dewey's Town Talk Barbecue. Everybody went to Dewey's for their barbecue. It didn't matter what color you are. You would get a greasy bag with barbecue that no one has been able to duplicate, even today. And there's the home of Mrs. Cole and her sister. Sits right there on the corner. Little did we know that it served as a boarding house where they would serve meals for as little as 25 cents for the overflow from the Woodman of Union when they would have large conferences. Yes, Pleasant Street was full of people from those conferences. Roanoke Baptist Church Parsonage, but it wasn't always a parsonage. People lived in that house that went on to do great things. How about Alfred Smith? Alfred went on to be one of the members of President Roosevelt's Black Cabinet. He also became a journalist with the Chicago Daily Defender, the largest African-American newspaper in the country. And his aunt, Dr. Mamie Fitz, worked with her husband, Dr. Kenneth Clark, on the Brown versus Board of Education. What a win for us. And it started right here on Pleasant Street. Next door to Mamie Fitz, lived Dewey Smith with his wife, the owner and the operator of, once again, the famous Town Talk Barbecue. And of course, across the street was Reverend and Mrs. Green Pascal. Their family kept the neighborhood full of children and grandchildren. Their love for us was shown in so many ways. That's right, Pastor Pascal was what we called him. Mr. and Mrs. Al Roy Puckett took up residence in the corner house right there on Pleasant. Mr. Puckett was the manager for the National Baptist Hotel, also known as the Woodman of Union, also known as Home Harbor. Diagonally across the street from Mr. and Mrs. Al Roy Puckett is a stately home that was built and refurbished for none other than Miss Carrie Elise Branson Webb by her husband, the Honorable John Lee Webb. They lived there from the early 20s until the middle of 1954. And across the street from this stately mansion was a house on the hill. Dr. John E. lived there with his wife and daughter, Janet Henrietta E. Now, Dr. E was famous because he was the owner and operator of the Alice E. Memorial Hospital, named after his sister. And it was there that Henrietta E, his daughter, received her basic hospital training. Henrietta E had her training in Hot Springs, Arkansas, at our elementary and high schools, Langston. But she went on to be with Fisk University, one of 1,900 doctors across the United States. Right next door to Dr. Eve was a beautiful home, all pink in color. I wonder why it was pink. Perhaps it was because the Honorable John Lee Webb built that house for his daughter. 
Emma Elise Webb. It was a graduation present for her. And as we travel a bit more down Pleasant Street, right next door to Mr. Webb lived Dr. Barabin. Now Dr. Barabin, Dr. E, and Dr. Kendall Ellis were all founding members of the Woodman of Union Building built in 1923 and opened to the public in 1926 to great hurrahs for the African American community or the Negroes or the Kluts, as we were called back then. What an honor. What a legacy to leave for all of us today. Those that can take pride in the accomplishments of any man building a building that would last this long. I think that recognition doesn't require any color. As we take our march and move to Garden Street, what a look at these houses. Who stayed there? What was going on? One was lived in by the alderman, Kenneth A. Deer, and his wife, sister to Valerie Roach Smith, who lived in the other house. And Miss Valerie volunteered for over 20 years at the Webb Community Center. This is how the hearts were built toward community and stabilizing the community and making it something that we could be proud of. Further down the street, again on a hill, there is the home of Dr. Torrance and Mrs. Collier. Next to him lived the Fane family. Jimmy Fane went on to be an entrepreneur who had liquor stores on Malvern Avenue. And at his passing, he owned a minimum of 25 pieces of property. We don't know today if that was all settled, but we do know that Jimmy Fain was a big name on that Avenue. <coughs> we turn the corner and we see E.B. Mooney had three row houses where people have lived and moved out and been able to sit on the front porch and watch all the happenings on Malvern Avenue. And at some point, something happened. A drive through liquor store was placed on the corner. No one seems to remember exactly when it happened, but we know that it happened, and it was the only one of its kind. So everybody went through the drive through liquor store. Lots of problems. <coughs> Across the street, we see Irene Edmonds' house. She and her husband built that home, but it was not just a home, it was commercial property. There are four cottages that surround it. Oral history has it that Ralph Porter and his wife spent their honeymoon in one of those cottages. And by the way, did you know that Ralph Porter was the son of the Ralph Porter, the famous trumpeteer? Wow, so many connections. So much happening, so much excitement on Malvern Avenue. We are now on Malvern Avenue. Malvern Avenue is so important to the Pleasant Street Historic District. Malvern Avenue, its commercial corridor and adjacent to the neighborhood, was once home to a thriving mixture of professional offices, stores, entertainment venues, and bathhouses. Walk with us and listen as Malvern Avenue speaks of the entertainers that came to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and our little part of the town. We can start at the famous Woodman of Union Building. We know for sure when it opened in 1926, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune was on the program with the National Colored Teachers Association. The Pythian Hotel, the atmosphere, the Coco Cabana. And another fact, did you know that 51% of the businesses on Malvern Avenue at one time 
were owned by the Page family. In a book called Conversations with William Jefferson Clinton, written by Janice F. Kearney, we find many quotes of oral histories of some of those who have now transitioned to tell us about those entertainers that came to Hot Springs, like the Ink Spots. If I didn't care more than words can. I think it's on, it's on an automatic stop. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Do we end it here? Anybody have questions? Okay. This did not end the information that we had for you, but that ends our time. Um, we have. Um, one of the uh, things that uh, we did not mention that I'd like to mention to you is that Malvern Avenue was also known as Black Broadway and was also a part of the Chitlin circuit. So as you got, came from the 20s into like the 50s, you had people like uh, Ike and Tina Turner who actually came and performed there. And we had some uh, peg leg bait we had a shot of him. Uh, Bill Bojangles Robinson also was a part of that black Broadway scene that made um, Malvin Avenue so important. So as we transition here, uh, we talked about the mapping of Pleasant Street, which takes in Malvin Avenue. As you can see, those two streets were, that's where we were. In that 28 acres, so there were entrepreneurs there. This very same listing that was given by Dr. Uh, Brian before, we had those same people living in that 28 acre place. Most of them were working in the bathhouses down on Bathhouse Row and working in the homes of other people. So, uh, so as you think about it, I think what we've done no, where you've got the down statistics down. from Dr. Brian, we've kind of showed you the pictures of the people and the places that they did. Different, uh, different uh, uh, genealogy, you know, ge geography, but... If you wanted to finish this, I would like you to. Okay, yeah, that's what I was trying to okay.
in the archives, waiting to be told in the not too distant future. Thank you for your time. If there are any questions, I'll be glad. We'll be glad to answer. Thank you so much. Have a great lunch. <laughs>